It's, uh, it's great to get an opportunity to, uh, to, to uh, be invited to speak here and, and, and close this thing up. Um, I might start with a little bit of a background on myself as well. Uh, I, I came to, uh, to Boston in 2001 as a doctoral candidate at MIT. I uh, joined the faculty there in 2006. Um, and my background is big, big data analytics. And specifically, it's data coming from mobile operators. Um, and it's called CDR, call data records. And so anytime you make a phone call or you receive a text message, or in many places, if you top up your phone, you know, these are all events that are recorded rows in a database. And um, operators are, are collecting literally petabytes of this data and to some degree are confounded about how, how to best leverage this asset. Um, and so I would come in and help them build models of churn and product adoption and looking at how um, you know, information spreads over the call graph. Um, but kind of by accident, I started falling into uh, this pattern of working with mobile operators in the developing world. And this was mainly because these are the organizations that had neither the computational horsepower nor the human rate resources, uh, frankly, to, to be able to analyze these petabytes of data. And, um, and one of the things that they were really con most concerned about, though, was ARPU, average revenue per user. And ARPU ac across these emerging markets is plummeting. The average subscriber in the developing world right now makes about $5 a day. Um, so there's a real upper bound to how much that typical mobile phone subscriber is going to pay for telecommunication services, no matter how great or how targeted we could make them. Um, so as I started, in, back in 2009, I was working with uh, close to two dozen mobile operators uh, where I had read-write access to their back-end billing system and helping them do this, uh, you know, basically do these analytics, but also understanding the fact that you know, they're all under massive pressure from their boards um, to, uh, to figure out how to solve the ARPU problem. Um, you know, to, to run a, a mobile operator, it's a huge amount of capex. And, uh, and when your subscriber base is getting, you know, essentially uh, has less and less disposable income on average, it's, uh, it's harder to make that case. Um, so that's my background. And uh, I ended up the genesis for this company that uh, I've now uh, you know, left most of my academic affiliations to, uh, to, to run uh, came from my work in Kenya, where I, had, uh, I was a Fulbright professor um, between 2006 and 2000, uh, uh, end of 2008 in uh, the University of Nairobi. And um, one of the projects that I worked on was with the uh, Kenyan Ministry of Health. And what we did was we... Um, we built this SMS blood bank system, a system that let uh, rural nurses across the country text in what the current blood supply levels were at their remote hospitals. And, um, and then we built this beautiful visualization that let the guys at these centralized blood banks across Kenya see in real time you know, what the current blood supply levels were in these hospitals, and, and more importantly, where the blood was needed. Right? And um, we launched this project in, uh, in 2008, and the first week it got a ton of press. And it was a huge success. You know, the guys from the centralized blood banks were logging in and seeing all this data. Um, the nurses were texting in the data. But the second week that we had the system running, uh, about half of the nurses across Kenya stopped texting in the data. And by about a month after the system had been live, virtually no nurse was texting in any more data. And the project was deemed a failure. And it, it failed not because of any technical shortcoming. I mean, technically, this thing, this platform was rock solid. Uh, it failed because of a fundamental lack of insight on my part. And that lack of insight has to do with the price of a text message. You know, what we were asking these rural nurses to do in Kenya was to send us a text message every single day. And um, what I failed to realize was that the price of an SMS represents a fairly substantial fraction of a rural nurse's day's wage. Right? So by asking them to participate in the system, which they, were, they wanted to do, they understood the benefits, um, we were ultimately asking them to take a pay cut. You know, something that fundamentally was not fair. And um, kind of luckily, uh, you know, I was in this position where at the time I was also working with literally every operator in East Africa and had access to their back-end billing systems. So um, I built you know, what we're calling today as an airtime rewards platform. And originally it was for Safaricom, the incumbent operator in Kenya, where we could credit that rural nurse you know, about 10 cents worth of airtime in exchange for a properly formatted text message with the day's blood supply levels. And um, you know, this was enough to compensate that individual for the text message, as well as about a penny to, uh, you know, extra to say thank you, you know, for participating. 
And uh, literally, for the opportunity to earn one penny of airtime, virtually every nurse re-engaged with the platform. And uh, you know, while there's, you know, this is something that now is being considered to be rolled out um, across East Africa, the, the realization from my perspective was, you know, suddenly we have a mechanism now to incentivize behavior. Uh, suddenly we have a mechanism now to compensate individuals on a scale that really has never before been possible. Um, so in 2009, um, I ended up uh, leaving academia and, and raising a, a small amount of money to, to see if this was viable. And so what we did is we just went through, literally, we, um, you know, I, would, uh, I would show up at the different operators with cash saying, hey, I want to buy airtime. You need to integrate with our airtime rewards platform, and, uh, and I'll just, I can keep giving you more cash. And um, that was a fun year. And um, at the end of that year, uh, we, uh, we had integrated with over 200 mobile operators. And, um, and what was exciting was we still really weren't sure what we were going to use this thing for. Um, you know, whether this was going to be a, uh, you know, whether, you know, whether we're going to do outsourcing type work. But, you know, the, the cool thing was is we had this ability to compensate people and, and a lot of people and, and do it in an instant way. Um, and originally, Procter & Gamble, you know, signed a contract with us, which was very exciting. And, you know, before they started working with us, they were literally, they were flying people from Cincinnati to Manila. They were renting Land Rovers, they are driving out in the field, and they're doing face-to-face -face surveys of rural Filipino women, asking them, you know, what do you think about laundry detergent? Right? We didn't have to make, you know, we have no sales team, uh, we, but we didn't have to make a strong case to the, these companies that, you know, clearly we've engaged with every operator in these countries. We've got this massive database of consumers. Instead of spending the money on plane tickets and Land Rovers, why don't we give 50 pesos to those rural women to fill out a five-question survey on their phone? Like, it just makes sense. Um, you know, we can get far more data. We can get it, turn it around far faster. It costs far less money. Um, but what was exciting, so, so we you know, started building these market research products and paying people to fill out surveys. But the exciting thing was then you know, P&G started wanting to know, well, how do we get these people to buy Tide, right? And, and, so in, and instead of getting 2,500 rural women to buy Tide, how do we get 25 million of these Filipino women to buy Tide? And again, the platform is kind of the same, the same play, play, whereas we're incentivizing some type of action. So instead of 50 uh, pesos to fill out a survey, you get 150 pesos to try Tide for the first time. And um, you know, this notion of being able to start incentivizing action uh, across these markets is, uh, is something that now has kind of taken, um, taken a life of its own. And, and uh, what's exciting is that we're really now exploring a lot of different uh, mechanisms to try to, uh, to, to reward consumer behavior. And it's a very, you know, these consumers are not consumers in North America or Western Europe. Uh, so this is, a, I love maps. This is one of my favorites uh, from National Geographic. It's kind of a mashup of uh, population density um, and uh, household income. And it also, I think it kind of tells a story of typically how, where innovation comes in the world. I mean, you know, when you launch a product initially, you, 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 you go after the North American markets or the Western, uh, Western European markets. And then when you saturate these kind of wealthy areas, you, you may jump into the, the, the 400 million people in Latin America or another 300 million in Eastern Europe. And if you saturate that market, suddenly you're jumping to a billion people in China, a billion people in India. And then eventually maybe you'll hit Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, with, as you roll out this product. Um, but the, the fact of the matter right now is that um, most major companies, uh, at least in, in the spaces that we're following, like the, the big CPG companies, these massive global brands, you know, and our clients, you know, ranging from Microsoft to Wrangler's Jeans, um, they know their future revenue and earnings growth is not coming from the blue countries. Right? The, the, their growth is coming from you know, this is the usual story, right? It's coming from Brazil, it's coming from India, China, Latin America. Um, and what's striking is how quickly this, is, this kind of transition is happening. So when I give talks at P&G or at Unilever, um, this is the slide that they want me to stay on for almost the entire talk. Uh, this, is, this is the uh, global sh uh, share of, of middle class consumption. And what it means is, you know, what you can see right now today, uh, the United States represents a pretty healthy fraction of uh, consumption by the middle class globally, right? And then there you can also see kind of the Western Europe um, with the, like, the majority of middle class consumption coming from the, the normal places. When my two-year-old son graduates from high school, right? So this is not too far away. Um, the world looks like a radically different place. 
right? And the future of these massive CPG companies, and frankly, most of these big global brands, is dependent on being able to start getting access to these middle class consumers in countries like India and China. Like the, the economics, the scale has truly inverted. And we have never in the history of our, you know, in the history of our species seen economic change this quick. Like it's extraordinary. Um, and, and it's not a really closed, it's not, it's not a secret. Um, you know, right now these big global brands are spending $200 billion every year advertising in the developing world. And that $200 billion is increasing by 15% a year because what they're trying to go after is this emerging middle class. Um, you know, today the, the GDP is, is around $74 trillion, $75 trillion. Um, if you fast forward to uh, 2050, uh, you're going to see an increase of over $300 trillion. So there's going to be an extra $300 trillion in this global economy. And, um, and where you're going to see most of that growth, is, again, it's not from Western Europe. It's not from this country. Um, you're going to start seeing it in developing Asia, Africa, Latin America. Um, and it's a massive, massive flux. So what I think a lot of people are a little bit scared about is the fact that um, you know, things are very different. Middle class consumption um, doesn't look like people clipping out coupons in their Sunday paper and going to Target and waiting in line to redeem them. Right? That's not what middle class consumption looks like anymore. Um, it, it looks much more like cash only, um, you know, local mom and pop uh, um, bodega type stalls. And uh, what's challenging is that you know, it's really difficult to try to figure out how to engage with these consumers. I had, had the opportunity about a month ago um, to have dinner with Paul Pullman, uh, who's the, the CEO of Unilever. All right, so Unilever earns the majority of their uh, uh, revenue right now from the developing world. And they're also the second largest advertiser in the world. Um, and you know, Paul has a couple different options when they, he wants to engage with, for example, a rural woman from India. Right? So he can, he can put money into the pockets of people who own billboards. He can put money into the pockets of people who own television uh, channels. Or he can put money into the pockets of the people who own the radio stations. And, you know, it's 1950s style engagement. Um, and if he wants to learn about those consumers, he has to put money into the pockets of people who ultimately rent Land Rovers and drive out into the field and do these face-to-face -face surveys. Like, it's, it's quite difficult to start engaging with these next billion consumers. Um, and it's not like these big global brands don't know the benefits of targeted marketing, right? It's just the, the fact of the matter is, for most of the world, there is no mechanism to target, right? That data about that rural uh, woman in, in India simply does not exist. And so you are stuck to the, the mass media channels. Um, I love, I, you know, I, so I, I started giving talks about mobile phones in the, in the developing world in 2004. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I thought this was an amazing stat. You know, it was like almost half of, of phones um, back in 2004 was, uh, you know, were, were, were in the developing world. Um, it's getting more, every time I, you know, give these talks over these years, it's, it's getting more and more extraordinary. And this is, this is the number of active subscriptions, right? So it's, you know, so we're actually at, um, today, uh, you know, I was in, in London a few weeks ago talking to the CEO of Ericsson, and his, uh, his estimate is that it's uh, 6.47 billion active subscriptions as of last month. Um, and you, know, you are seeing penetration that is extraordinary. Like in Vietnam, there are more phones than people, right? I mean, it's uh, like penetration truly is ubiquitous. And um, you know, a mob the mobile phone, I think it's hard to argue that the mobile phone is a developing world technology. You're looking at this chart. Um, and, uh, and so that's what's, I mean, I think there's some, something that's really exciting here is that suddenly you have this emerging middle class. You have this uh, group of, of massive numbers of people who are suddenly you know, finding to themselves with some economic in, uh, empowerment, uh, some disposable income. And suddenly, you know, they are becoming connected, truly connected. Um, and, uh, and so there's, that, that presents a, a pretty awesome opportunity. And so, um, you know, what ultimately, uh, you know, we're doing now uh, as a company is going after something that I think is a really, really big, hairy, audacious goal, uh, but one that has been a lot of, a lot of fun to work on. Um, 
So when we went out and raised that original seed round, we got, we got uh, you know, about access, access to close to, you know, it was just over two billion people uh, where we could instantly compensate them uh, with denominations as low as about 10 cents. Um, today, we're now at 3.48 billion people, which as far as I know is the largest consumer database in the world, but more important than just daily's data, we can not only communicate with these 3.48 billion people, we can compensate them. And so what that means, you know, from a technical perspective, is, you know, we have this you know, the list of the 875 million prepaid phone numbers in India. We've integrated with every single one of the operators there. We can pick a number at random. You know, we type it into my laptop, I type in 50 rupees, I push enter, and then within seven to 10 seconds, no matter where that phone is in India, no matter whether it's an iPhone or a, or a 10 year old candy bar Nokia phone, um, that subscriber gets a message saying, you've just received 50 rupees. And what is, in my mind, so profound is that that individual views that as equivalent to getting 50 rupees in cash. Right? So you could go to that person in India or in China or in Brazil or in Nigeria um, and say, look, look I, you know, if, if we're in India, I'll give you 50 rupees in cash or I'll put 50 rupees on your handset. The average sub spends 10% of their day's wage on airtime. Right, so, so you know, this, this is legitimately currency. You know, we have the ability not to send people free, you know, 10 free text messages or 20 minutes of talk time. We are sending money in 70 currencies. So, so we're, we're, we're literally sending rupees. Um, and what's, what's also pretty cool about, about it is that, um, you know, this is not a, uh, this is friction free. So we can send that money instantly. There isn't any banking regulations. Um, and it means that we can, we can move very, very quickly. Um, so as, as far as I know, you know, there's no other company that has even an order of magnitude of this global breadth. Um, we, are, we are unique, and it, it, and it means that we can do things that ne never before have been possible. And I, frank I think, frankly, the challenge of running this company is that you know, we have this massive hammer, right? We have this ability to compensate 3.48 billion people and the world looks like nails, right? You know, like we, so we've, I was just at uh, the World Bank. The World Bank has this interesting thing. They, they, they calculate purchasing power parity, PPP. By uh, every four years, they fly out uh, professional price collectors into 100 countries, and, uh, and they go out and gather, you know, try to figure out what the price of a kilo of rice costs in that local market in one of those 100 countries. They spend $77 million every four years doing that price collection data. Um, you know, now the bank is using our platform, where you're not having to fly people out, but rather you actually get people living in, next to that local market to tell you what the price is. Um, I mean, that's, that's a nail that I think has been a fun one to hit for us. Um, Unilever, as far as from their perspective, um, they are now claiming that they have launched the first couponing campaign across rural India uh, with our technology. And so they printed unique codes on, uh, on you know, tons of, of, of different types of shampoo, and, and people are getting 10 rupees back you know, when, they were, when they type in that unique ID printed on the, camp, uh, on the shampoo. And, it's, and it is like 10, 10 rupees off the product. Um, we're providing a lot of insight uh, into you know, four companies ranging from Microsoft to, uh, you know, to, to um, Danone Yogurt um, uh, about you know, what do consumers think about their products across you know, globally. Um, uh, working with the United Nations to ask people you know, across now 50 countries what they think about their uh, local government uh, representation. And again, compensating people for this level of engagement. And not compensating people much, you know, literally pennies, but to, you know, it's enough to have people feel like their voice is being, being valued. Um, so it's, uh, it's, the challenge is figuring out you know, what ultimately do we want to, you know, what nail are we ultimately going to be hitting in the, lo in the long term. Um, but, uh, but the fun thing is, you know, we've now got uh, 200, as of last Friday, we have 237 um, mobile operator partners. We're live now in 102 countries. Um, and just, we're, you know, we're doing a wide range of things. And, um, and I'd love to hear from the audience of what, 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 what kind of nails you guys have. Um, you know, ranging, ranging from trying to get insight into, into these markets, trying to drive some type of action. Um, uh, we find that it's, uh, it's been quite surprising how different organizations and people want to start using our, uh, our platform. 
and the platform from uh, a consumer, a member's perspective, that, that, in, that rural woman in, in, uh, in India, we try to be as uh, communication channel agnostic as possible. So if, you know, if that person has a you know, Nokia phone, then that's how they engage, they engage with us, you know, with something, a handset with that capability via SMS or USSD. Uh, proxy browsers, you know, more standard full-size Androids type um, devices, and then you know, for a lot of a lot of people, and this is also quite surprising for for some people. You know, to take the Philippines for example, the uh, the government um, of the Philippines estimates that um, 31 million of its citizens have touched the internet at least once. Um, there are over 30 million active Facebook users in the Philippines. So so Facebook and the internet are synonymous, like. You know, if, if you are on the internet, you're on Facebook. And that, has been, that is now kind of true across a lot of APAC and increasingly true across Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Facebook has done just, a, they have been genius at um, getting, getting penetration. Um, I know we can talk about that perhaps offline about the different tactics they've used, but it's meant for us that we can now start um, building our platform on top of Facebook and engaging with these consumers that people wouldn't necessarily traditionally see as Facebook users. Um, uh, we can start leveraging what face, the, the tools that Facebook brings to the table um, to, uh, to enable people to earn airtime. You have to have a cell phone in order to participate in any of the stuff we do. Um, but uh, as I think you probably now know, like, that, is, that is true for the vast majority of our species. So yeah, I, I, can, I can wrap it up. Um, you know, we're doing you know, work on market research. Uh, we're selling different types of products. A, a few months ago, we doubled yogurt sales for Danone in Indonesia, right? And we did it by just giving people small amounts of airtime in exchange for you know, buying this particular bundle of yogurt. Um, it clearly works. Like, this is a mechanism we can uh, use to drive, drive behavior, um, and as well as drive, I think, some pretty interesting data about, about these different types of consumers. Um, but I, I think I'm out of time, and what I wanted to wrap it up with was, was something that I think you know, is the reason why I, I view this, this type of technology as so empowering. Um, and it, it comes down to the fact that you know, there is this $200 billion, it's just like a pile of money that's being pushed into advertising in the developing world. And what I think we have is the technology that can redirect a substantial fraction of that $200 billion away from the pockets of the people who own billboards and towards the pockets of the individual consumers that these global brands are trying to reach. I mean, it's wealth redistribution on an unprecedented scale. Um, and if we're successful, if we can get about half of the money being spent on things like billboards, you know, directed into the pockets of the consumers that these brands are trying to reach, we can take the average spend that of, that in, of that mobile phone subscriber from 10% of their day's wage to 5% of their day's wage. And what that means is that we're giving a billion people a 5% raise. We're giving a billion people 5% more disposable income. Now, people like Paul Pullman love that story because that's 5% more money they could use to spend on shampoo. Right? But frankly, I don't care. Right? I mean, I don't think there are many times. I mean, it's the, reason, it's the reason why I left my job, to go pursue this opportunity. You don't get presented many opportunities where you can provide economic empowerment. You're, at least you even have a fraction of a chance to provide economic empowerment on a scale of this magnitude. You know, having a chance to provide a billion people with a 5% raise is, um, I mean, I think it's just really, really awesome. And, uh, and again, I welcome any and all help to try to, uh, try to continue to capitalize on, on this opportunity. Thank you. One thing I was struck by with this is that the mobile phone is so important to people that they're paying so far into what they can afford that, this, that your stuff works, which is wonderful. And, but that says a lot about the price of that, what happens with Moore's Law and stuff like that, but also um, how important this thing has become, which affects everything else we think about. In other words, it's very interesting what you're doing, and we can use it for all sorts of wonderful things, but it is... It's, it's a, a canary in the, um, in the mine shaft about we really, really have to pay attention to how much people are so willing to have that, to use it, 
the things that they do want it mean so much to them. Yeah, and pay for it, and it's represented by how much they're willing to yeah. pay. But um, it's also a platform now to do things. The big thing was that Apple has the credit card numbers with iTunes, you know, of millions and millions of people. But you're saying, wait a second, you suddenly have, in essence, the opposite of credit card. I can put give money to millions and millions and millions of people. Billions. Which, billions of people, sorry, billions of people. And that's, it's this instant switch into a new area that is enabled by the fact that all these people all over the world, especially in the parts that we can't get to otherwise, we now have a conduit to, without Land Rovers. That's, that's really cool. I agree. So what other things are you seeing, Kate? So what other things are you seeing besides just being able to give them money? Oh, look, that's all I'm focused on. Uh, I mean, I can tell, I can, you know, I helped, um, you know, with uh, the Safaricom launch of something called M-Pesa, which was kind of a mobile, a mobile money uh, platform. Um, you, you're, you see all sorts of exciting innovations where there is fundamental leapfrogging, uh, you know, where you're seeing the innovation happen in a place like Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and, you know, so we were working on, on, you know, back in 2006 when I was living in Kenya, I would pay for my taxi to the airport with my mobile phone. Like, this is well before anyone was talking about Google Wallet. Right, um, so you are really seeing some some you know phenomenal innovation. But from our company perspective, we made a very uh, conscientious decision that this was a one-way street, meaning we don't extract money from people's accounts. Like this technology exists for one thing and one thing only: uh, economic empowerment. And so you know, so that's that's how I think we're a little bit different from the Apple iTunes model. I'm Jim Daniel. I run a large NGO here in Boston called Oxfam. America. Mm -hmm. So I've got a bunch of nails for you, but the question really is, uh, you know, as we reach out to uh, the, the developing world, who owns the customer in this regard? In other words, are you able to access the, through the uh, 237 mobile operators the majority of their customers, or if we wanted to develop all on of their top prepaid. of your platform? What's that? All of their prepaid subs. Um, and, and we do because, I mean, it's it's, I, I think there's a data ownership question on two fronts. There's the, the you know, does Unilever own the data? Does the mobile operator own the data? Do we own the data? Um, uh, from an operator perspective, they don't know who these people are, right? You go, you go to any of these countries and you, people are now, operators are literally giving SIM cards away, right? Um, so there is no information, you know, demographic information about these individuals. It's just a prepaid number. Um, when we get people to go out and buy a bottle of shampoo, for example, they need to register. And we only run campaigns where, at a minimum, we can co-own the data with the client. So when they go out and we give them that 10 rupees, um, they're opting in to receiving other targeted offers to earn even more airtime in the future. And, and that's how we're building out this, this massive database of consumers. And ultimately, that is the core asset of the company. Right? Our clients think of us as anything from like a market research company to a, a, you know, a sales and promotion company to a CRM solution. But the fact of the matter is we're a big data play. Um, and it's like it's, that is the core asset of the business. Nathan, uh, on your uh, going back to that the World Bank study that you did on the pricing parity, did the World Bank uh, run your version of the study in parallel? Oh, with absolutely. Their standard? And what what was the correlation? We we were able to replicate the data that they were getting really? from uh, oh. professional price so collectors. You, so you didn't you didn't get any kind of end user. Uh, no, I mean the way we I, like, and we can get it there. We had to build a separate platform to do to to enable data validity. I mean, the, but the short answer is you send uh, ten independent people to the same market, asking what the price of a two-liter bottle of Coke is. If they all give you back the same answer, you know, you can assume that that's probably the right one. Uh, in which case, you know, you can then you know maybe you only need five the next time. You can start building up a confidence and a reliability associated with each price collector. Um, and so there's some fun machine learning, uh, but, but yeah, we can replicate what they've done. There's a huge database. I uh, assume that uh, no privacy uh, is considered at all. And today, with this uh, emerging middle class, which makes $3 a day, probably they don't really care about their privacy. But when this uh, middle class really form into the middle class, they will start care about it, and it will probably uh, require you to change the whole approach, how you will protect it, and how you will make sure that the personal information you collect will not leak and uh, 
cause some oh, big trouble. But I mean, I want to reemphasize that that personal information is the core asset of the company. We never share that. Um, but so, so the, I think the, also the other question thing is it's always opt in. So we abide by you know all the all the regula regulations that they have to protect consumers in this country. We abide by those for in every country we operate. Um, so, so it's not like we're going out and spamming these three billion people. Uh, the way they find out about it is they see that that advertisement from Unilever, or you know we've done referral campaigns where you get a penny for every friend that you refer. Uh, when you refer, people go on and uh, and you register and you opt in for offers, and you can always opt out at any point in time. In which case, your data is completely purged from the system. Yeah. Okay, so you are at, uh, at mercy of uh, the technology, which probably will protect your. Uh, the, the information collected. Okay. So when I see your six and a half billion number for the number of mobile numbers out there, that tells me even allowing for some people having mobile phones, teledensity has to be really high. I'm sorry? The teledensity has to be really high now. Yes. So part A is, if you have a figure for that, I'd be interested in that. Part B is then thinking about wherever it is today to 100% for truly universal coverage. ARPU versus uh, daily income is one barrier. Mm -hmm. The other, it strikes me, and potentially a barrier for what you're trying to do in the empowerment, is literacy. So I'm Absolutely. curious about uh, your thoughts. Literacy on is that. tricky. Um, I mean, it's interesting. Some, a lot of our clients tend to want to ignore the bottom of the pyramid completely. Um, and uh, in fact, virtually all of them that are not the World Bank or the UN, frankly. Um, but it is, you know, when you start going one level up, you know, from the bottom of the pyramid, you're still talking about a, a segment of consumers that are not literate. Um, and so for you know, these types of campaigns, we use IVR. So that what they do is they flash the number on the bottle. Um, you know, that doesn't require any airtime. We then have an automated system that calls them back, uh, and they register via voice. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank Jason. you.